Um, I'm Dan Janot from Agribeef. So I, my role at Agribeef, I'm the director of quality and continuous improvement there. And to explain what I do, that's pretty hard. So I'll, uh, I'll just leave it at that. If you guys want to come talk to me later about it, we can. Um, but but I, I end up touching most parts of our business from the live animal all the way through to our direct-to-consumer sales. So um, real quick, I... I don't know if you guys noticed this order was purposeful. It's so I can say stuff and then Blake can come back and correct what I say. So I made him go last so he could fix, play back clean up here and fix everything. I want to start out with a story real quick. Earlier this year, I was, uh, I was in Atlanta for a conference and we went to dinner and they handed us the menu. And on the menu, it had Japanese Wagyu, Australian Wagyu, American Wagyu. And I said, uh, where's, your, where's your American Wagyu from to the, to the waitress? And she got a puzzled look and she said, Australia. And I said, no, 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 the American Wagyu. And she thought for a minute and goes, yep, Australia. So we might have some work to do. <laughs> All right. If, for those of you that don't know about Agribeef, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a background. I'll be pretty quick through these slides and then we'll get into some of the information. Also... I'm not gonna have a Q&A session at the end, so stop me if you have a question, and I'll answer it. Otherwise, at the end, I have to go back and go, what were you we talking about? So if you, if you see something you say, I wanna know more about that, or I don't understand that, just yell, because I might not see you raise your hand either, so. Uh, yell to me, and I'll, I'll answer what I can, so. And if not, we'll ask Blake. All right, so our mission at AgriBeef is to sustainably produce the highest quality beef products and deliver ex exceptional customer service. That's been our mission for years. For those of you that don't know, we're a multi-generational family-owned company. And so our current CEO is the second generation, the third generation's heavily involved, works in the day-to-day -day operations in our, in our organization. Our core values focus on leadership, integrity, and innovation. And we, we put this on every box, it's our star commitment. So it's sustainability, total quality, animal well-being, and responsibility. I think these are things that we can all agree on and say, yeah, those are important, we should do those. A uh, little bit about our history, 1968, um, Bob Rebholtz, or Robert Sr., uh, bought a feed yard in Idaho, and everything else is history, I guess. And uh, they, they grew the feed yard business, ended up buying a a packing plant in Washington in the early 2000s. And then recently we built a new packing plant in Idaho. And so we kind of have, um, go from that live animal, like I said, all the way through, and even have a direct to consumer marketing program. Uh, some of our locations, we cover the, the Northwest. That's the easiest way to say it. And then California, uh, parts of California. So we have producers that we, we work with from all, all these states. We, we look at these producers as partners. We know that the lifeblood of, of what we do, particularly on the packing side, is, is the producer. So we, we try to work with them and get to know them, and a lot of them we know by name and face and see them everywhere and, and visit with them, and they're in our communities, and so we, we get to know them well. A little bit, I'm actually missing something on this slide, I realized, it's an older slide. Uh, so this some of our locations, for those of you in Washington, we've got yard, uh, a yard in uh, Moses Lake, outside of Moses Lake, one in Connell, um, down by Altopia, and then we've got some stuff in, in the Boise area, and then all the way over to Pocatello, outside of Pocatello in American Falls. And then the, the feed yard, excuse me, the packing plants would be in Toppenish, and then over in Jerome, Idaho. So some of our brands are... I'll, I'll focus a little bit actually on, on livestock. So, so one of the divisions, primary divisions in uh, Agribeef would be our livestock group. And the job of the livestock group is to supply the packing plants with beef every day. And it seems kind of easy, uh, but it's not. <laughs> when, when we have this constant every day, we've got, to, we've got these gaps, these shackles that have to be filled, and we've got to go out and find those animals or make them. And so they, they kind of play on both ends of that. So we feed some, we buy some, we, we work on both ends of that. In our SRF, uh, most of you guys would be familiar with the F1Y goose. That's our model. So we, we do um, 
A lot of work on our genetics on our bulls, send those bulls out by the calves back, feed them in our lots, um, and then we process them in our plants. And so the, that's where a lot of our partnership has to take place, is working with all these producers that we're gonna send bulls to, that we're gonna work with and, and bring those back into our yard, feed yards and ultimately into our beef. You told you a little bit of that. And then we also have a conventional program. Um, our Wagyu only makes up about, um, I'd say about an eighth to a tenth of the beef we process. Um, it's a significant more portion of beef, but there's a lot of other conventional beef we've got to get through the plant to fill those shackle spaces and be able to account for the plant. So, all right, so that, go ahead. Um, it, it'll probably stay in that range for now. So is that, is that? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, any other questions about agri-beef before I go into focus on what we do around the Wagyu about agri-beef in general? Okay. I'm going to talk about it. So some of the stuff we track, and this is where I come in. So a lot of what I do is the data. Uh, my background actually is a meat scientist. And so I spent a lot of time and I spent a lot of time at other beef processors working on grading. Um, and so that's where I came into agri-beef, working with the grading and actually working with the genetics group on understanding what all the camera data and the grading data actually meant. And so we, so if you see too many tables, I apologize beforehand. That's how, the only way I know how to make PowerPoints is to add a lot of tables. So hopefully they're, hopefully they make sense. So, so this table here, this is a, just a, a histogram of producers that we work with. And the idea is we, we have a lot of variation, even in producers. If we just take the marbling score, the average marbling score of a producer's calves, we can see we have a lot of variation. Now, some of that variation comes from us, from the bulls. Some of that variation comes from the producer. Some of it comes from the system that the producer is functioning under. So we, if you notice, we have cattle coming all the way from Montana to California. They're very different animals coming from California and Montana, and they come in at different, as different calves, right? So we do that on purpose because we don't get to kill once. We've got to kill every day, and so we've got to have cattle every day, and we've got to have Wagyu every week. And so we're, we have to be able to control incoming calves. And so we use a lot of California guys that can have calves in the fall, run them through the winter, and then in Montana, that's probably not as good of an idea to do unless you have a big barn to store them all in. So uh, we, don't, we don't have that system up there. So we kind of have this variation that, that's kind of natural and we expect, but we try to manage it and understand how can we optimize our producers and help our producers to, to get better as we grow and they grow. So that was, that was our producers. This is our EPDs on Wagyu bulls. And so this is, this is kind of that distribution. So you see we have a we have a variation, we have variation in our bulls as well. And so when you combine that variation, there's actually one more slide that we'll talk about more in a second on this. But when you combine those variations, they start getting confounding and, and or compounding actually, is the better way to say it. And we start seeing how to, it gets to a big math problem, right? And so we have to identify how can we optimize these bulls? How can we continually progress and get better and help our producers get better? And then, what we came up with is our producers don't always get to know how well they do. And part of that is if we send them a bull, that's the bull they got. And their EPD might be a little lower. And so that whole glut of calves from them might not perform as well as a bull that's our best bull. And so we, we have to understand what's the impact of our producers, either environment or their base genetic herd that we're working with. And how does that impact really the, the, and this is just marbling scores that we're looking at here. There's other factors we, we look at, but just for ease of understanding what we're talking about, this is what we're looking at. And so we built this ranch effect EPD. And this allows us to try to understand a little bit what that environment brings. And so if you're a producer in Big Piney, Wyoming, there's a different environment than if you're in California or, or central Nevada. And so we, we're trying to understand how that environment and that base genetic herd will impact the, the calf that we get at the end. And then ultimately, how do we marry the right bull with the right producer? 
so that we're not just randomly sending bulls, but we can at some point, hopefully, get this all math problem figured out and say, hey, this bull would optimize the, those cattle. This bull would help that cattle herd, and that cattle herd's the right herd for this, this bull. That gets really hard to sit down and do by hand with a lot of bulls. It's maybe okay if we have 10, but we have a little bit more than that. And so we, we're trying to figure out how do we put this into an algorithm can, that can calculate this for us and return something that, that really progress this forward. So having done all this, we've, we've been working on these EPDs and, and this, uh, this genetic work for years. This isn't year one. Um, so, oh, I skipped a slide. I'm going to skip these slides for now because I want to show you this first. There we go. What we've seen is over time, and I only did, if I put every year, it gets really, really hard to read. So for, the, for your guys' benefit, uh, I only put three years. Also, just so you know, there is someone here that knows this about me, but I'm slightly colorblind, so I have to put the colors way different. I've done this in presentations where I put two colors the same, and I sat there trying to figure out which one I was telling them about, and everyone laughs, so I've learned my lesson. Um, so what you see is here, if you guys are familiar, these are normal, just normal distribution curves of our marbling year over year. So this, uh, this orange line would have been year one. So I, I use that as just a starting year. It actually goes way back before that, but this is far enough back to, to see what we've been doing. And you see our mean marbling shifting up. And if you look at why it's shifting up, and actually year six, you see it shrink. That's not necessarily the ideal situation. What's happened though, is we've pulled our highest marbling, the count of our highest marbling up drastically. So we end up getting these highest marbling animals, and we've gotten a lot more of them than we did in the past, and it's kind of pulled that curve a little flatter. What you'll notice, though, is where our work needs to take place is down here, right? So the lowest ones we need to cut out. Now, they are not eligible for our program. We have a minimum for our program, and so we kick those out of the program anyway, but they still show up as we fed them, we treated them, we paid for them, everything for Wagyu, but we just didn't get them to fit into the right program. And so we don't want those guys because they're expensive, but we want to make sure that we understand what's producing those. So that's our next iteration of work, right? We spent so much time. How do we get better? How do we get better? And now we say, wait, how do we clean these up? How do we not have these anymore? I'm going to walk back. Sorry, this is out of, a little out of order. So I want to show you some pictures real quick. Have any of you ever seen camera data from a from a uh, USDA grading camera. These are actually built by a company out of Germany. And so this, this is a raw image and a processed image. So the way this works is this camera takes an image. It takes an average of the back fat area here, traces the ribeye, gives you a width and a height of the ribeye, and then it goes through and, and calculates the amount of marbling in here, and it returns a marbling score. And so this particular image that you see here is about as high as the camera can catch. Much higher than that, and the camera can't catch it. And I'll tell you why. It's not that the camera doesn't have the capability. It's that for years, the USDA said, no animal can ever go higher than about 1,000 marbling score. Why do kind of start around that? And so they were like, no, no animal can do that. No animal can do that. So they set the stand. They said, well, you can't, to the camera pr provider, you can't return a score higher than this. If you do, then we think it's a fake score. And so the camera provider had a cap, and it wasn't until a few years later that they were able to open that up and go, and they still put a cap. They just moved the cap up higher. And so I'm going to show you this slide. Looks the same. This one on this side is as high as the camera really can catch using the USDA marbling equation. This one's outside of its range. So you guys have seen stuff like this, I'm sure. So it's hard to get good data, and, and, we, and we, not, where's, I think it was Arlie. Yeah, she was talking about Prime, right, earlier. She had one that graded high Prime. We love, we love our quality grades, and we love our buckets, but for us to do the genetic work, we have to be able to get that real score. Where is it actually at? So we have to have this continuous data set, rather than having these broken up, oh, this one's Prime, this one's Choice. We have to be able to say, it's, 1,000 marbling units, or it's 1,100, or whatever it is, so that we understand really where we're at. So I wanted to show you, there are some limitations there. We have some workarounds we've developed with these guys. Um, 
part of what happens is the USDA says, well, if it can't trace the ribeye, it can't tell me how much marbling's in there. And it gets real hard to distinguish up in here where's the, what's marbling and where the fat is. And so it, it struggles to do that. So we've got some ways to work around it to allow us to get some data out of this, and this isn't a lost cause. But we, we do have to be cognizant of that. So one of the other things we've spent a lot of time on is, is fatty acids. Understanding what's the, the difference between Wagyu and our, and our commodity herd. Um, are you guys familiar with MUFAs and PUFAs? That's what they're called. But monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. And so these are the guys that are usually your good ones in here, the good fatty acids. And we, we see that increase. I actually have this by fatty acid, by all the fatty acids. And so we, we look at individual ones and say, okay, this one's really showing up. And so we see the things that provide that unique flavor we all love and why, probably why most of us are here for that. And so we, we see those fatty acids showing up and that they're, they're substantially higher in our Wagyu. We see um, some fatty acids that are a little bit newer um, that we just recently, there's a saturated fatty acid that's a 15-0 fatty acid that was recently um, postulated that it's an essential fatty acid. Usually we think of saturated fatty acids as the bad guys, and this one they've decided is necessary for us to, to be able to function health, in a healthy lifestyle. So, and it, it tends to be higher in the Wagyu as well. So we see all of this kind of understanding a little bit why we see these differences in the Wagyu versus the commodity. Another thing I think I kind of went through this a little bit is, is our marbling distribution. So if the light blue, that is light blue, right? Yep, light blue here. This is a distribution of, our, our, of what would be our commodity cattle, their marbling scores. And all this is showing is kind of how we see those, those showing up. And I'm, I'm gonna say this, I guess this is my plug for agri-beef is, from a commodity cattle standpoint, on a large scale, it's hard to beat what we buy and what we produce. And so we have exceptionally high grading commodity beef. And then, but you see how much even higher our Wagyu are. And so when you start understanding really where it starts and where they kind of overlap, we've done a lot of this work, that work you just saw takes place in here to understand the true difference between, because if I go and grab this guy and compare it to this guy, of course this guy's gonna win every time, right? This guy that's got all this marbling, this is the king, right? Versus the worst one we can produce. But as soon as I start looking in here, that's where it really matters. And we see that same thing in here showing up. We see the saturated, the fatty acid profile in there. We see the difference from those. We see improvements in tenderness. We see improvements in, in palatability from, from uh, uh, trained sensory panels. So we've done all this work to try to understand it. So ours would all be ours would all be half bloods. We actually a lot of these guys. Um, I'll say this: we end up with a couple half bloods that don't. That it's like a one. We send one or two, but we're not going to change over for the whole days. You know, a whole package. So they end up going into commodity beef, and so we get these kind of things now and then that get way out here. We've got some natural Angus breeders that do a really good job, and so they end up being up here um, as well. So that's kind of on this side. Those would be those naturals. And then on this side, they're all half-bloods, but these are the kind of the mid-range performers versus the upper echelon. What's that? Yeah, I think they are. I think that's what I believe, but I can't. I'll tell you, I've proved it on some. On some, I haven't proved it on all of them yet. How about that? <laughs> So we do work with Neogen quite a bit, and so we're able to do, ne where's John? I'll give you a plug, okay. So we do, uh, <laughs> we, do, uh, we do a lot of work with Neogen, and we're able to look at some uh, percentages of, of their breed makeup. Uh, what's it called, BreedSeq, right? Yeah, BreedSeq, and so we're not doing that on 100%, but we started kind of exploring, hey, is this gonna help us understand a little bit more? Why, and this goes back to that point, why is that lower tail holding still, right? And so is it, is it something that we are paying a lot for that maybe 
maybe it wasn't a Wagyu. I mean, we know bulls can jump fences. So anyway, one of the things that's interesting with that camera, I, I have to change this data a little bit because if I don't, there's a peak right here just a big, huge line because that's where the camera stops. And so all this stuff that would be this tail going out here all gets piled up into this one line because we have to use that USDA marbling grade. Um, and it says, hey, well, you can't go beyond here. So I'll, I'll tell you an interesting anecdotal story is when we started um, our own quality grades, so we have our own quality grades, we, we started and, and we... Um, we took our top grade, and we, uh, you guys can see it on our website. It's called gold, but we have this gold grade, and it's our highest marbling Wagyu that we have. And we said, well, that starts at point X, right? And when we did that, we had like 10% above, and none of them, there was a handful of them hit here. Well, we spent all this time doing all this genetic work, and what happens is we pushed everything up here. We pushed all these, and then all of a sudden, you get these guys that we never would have seen, like that you get these really, really heavily marbled ones. Like the one I showed you, they're even further on. Well, back to Arlie's point about influencers, those are the ones that influencers show on Instagram. So they go, look what a gold ribeye should look like. And then all of a sudden the other chefs call and go, hey, mine didn't look like that. Mine was down further in that bucket. And, and it's actually our own fault. We've done it to ourselves because when we had the line where it was, nobody said anything. But it's once we started getting so much better and we pushed our limit, they started saying, hey, we want all of them to be out there at the limit. And we're like, well, give us some time. We need some more time. So, yes. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. No, no, no. It's, good. it's a very good question. So if I don't answer it by the end, tell me I, you didn't answer it sufficiently, and then I'll talk more about it. That works. So we saw that. This goes to her point. One of the other things we look at is carcass size, right? So bigger carcasses, we tend to get more meat off of. And so this light blue, again, is our, our commodity cattle. Dark blue would be our Wagyu. You see a lot more overlap on this than you do on the marbling. So the sizes are, there's less variation for, between the means on carcass size than there is between on marbling. Does that make sense? I think I said that right, so. And then finally, to your point, the, we call that yield grade or yield. And so that's one of the things we're concerned, out with, concerned with. And this is a, a point I like to make is a lot of times as, as individuals, we get confused about what our product is. I worked, I grew up on uh, some ranches uh, in the Southeast and they, they recently got in the cattle feeding business and the ranches still think their product is a weaned calf. And then they send them to their feed yard and they're like, why can't the feed yard fix all these? And I'm say, I, I always tell them, I said, your product's not a weaned calf anymore, it's a fed calf. And so you gotta treat it like my product's a fed calf. If, if you're selling fed Wagyu, then your product is a fed Wagyu. But if you're selling the beef, your product's beef, right? And so we, we had to go back and say, well, all that work we do on the live has to translate. And so we got to get pounds of beef in a box or it doesn't matter, to your point. And so we actually did a cutout. Um, so we cut um, 120 head or something like that of Wagyu and non-Wagyu. And they're quite intensive. In fact, we did this with Blake when he was just a little bitty grad student like two years ago. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're, I got to pick on him because... Uh, so, so that's when I first met Blake, actually. We spent a week in the coolers uh, selecting cattle to, for this cutout. And so the goal with this is to identify or to understand what the true yield of these animals are and how we can predict that yield from a carcass attributes rather than having to say, it, it's really hard to weigh every piece, tie it back to each animal in the, in the throughput that we have. So we built this and I went back and said, well, what really matters? Historically in, in commodity beef, we typically talk about red meat yield. So how many pounds, or how, what percent of the carcass is red meat? And that's a valid measurement. And that's how we've built a lot of our, our prediction models in commodity beef. Um, for us, our limitation is shackle space. So we only have so many spots we can hang a carcass every day. And so we have to get the most pounds put through that, 
that system in order to have the most pounds to sell and to reduce the cost of the system per unit, per pound as a unit, right? And so we look back at red meat pounds. And so this, this graph that I have here is one I built a few years ago after this cutout to show if I take uh, hot carcass weight, back fat, and ribeye area, and some, if there's any statisticians in here, they'll flog me after for using hot carcass weight and using that to predict an out, an, uh, pounds per head. But the, uh, the, what we were able to do is say, hey, if we plug these in, I can give you a really good prediction of how many pounds of beef you're going to have in a box to sell at the end of it. And that allows us to say, we have sales in this range. We have people asking for this much. We need this kind of animal. We need this kind of um, processing. We need this kind of thing to build that animal. And so it allows us to feed this information all the way back. Allows us to feed it back to a bull and say, these kind of cow, this bull is going to produce a calf that's going to yield more. It might grade. So if you have two that grade evenly, you won't want the one that's going to get you more beef, right? The one that's going to have more beef with the same in the same system, right? So we can always say, oh, we'll just feed it 100 days longer or whatever, 30 days longer. But it, but when they happen at the same time, they're treated the same. They came from the same ranch. You start or the same data set, or let me see that, herd, cattle herd, then you start saying, um, hey, I want that one that's going to get us more beef in the box at the end of it, more quality beef. Does that answer your question at all? Okay. That would be the Wagyu. That's our brand for it. Yeah. Sorry, I should keep, keep it consistent. Huh? Um, one of the things you do see here, you do see the bone doesn't change a lot. I mean, there's a little bit of change in bone, but most of that change is just, is just due to when you add a lot of fat, the percentage of the bone there can't, isn't as high, right? And so you, you're, you're diluting that percentage of bone by adding more fat, more pounds of fat. So we see about a 2.5% increase in fat between the Wagyu and the conventional. The trim stays about the same, and our cuts are actually very close. They're a little bit lower, but when you go back and say, how many pounds of red meat am I going to be able to sell? It's substantially higher in the Wagyu. A lot of that comes from that carcass weight. You start with a bigger carcass, you end with more meat usually. So for those of you that don't under, does everybody here familiar with the USDA yield grade equation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this with we don't use it in Wagyu. And I'm going to show you why a little bit. But the USDA yield grade equation takes those variables. It takes back fat, ribeye area. And back fat was that shaded, that kind of green shaded area on the ribeye that I showed you. So ribeye area would have been the area of that traced ribeye. Um, uses KPH. Most of the industry, or a lot of the industry, has standardized this. And so we kind of took that out of this equation because it's really hard to measure. Um, and it, it just made more sense. And it's not highly influential, we think. And the last one would be hot carcass weight. <clears throat> so the point I always, the old grade would go from, typically it goes from a one to five. We usually look at it on a, uh, on a floored number or a rounded number, so it ends up at the, if it's a 4.5, it actually goes back down to four. So we bring it down, we don't ever round it up. And so when I, the point I like to make with this is, is people think, well, I, I have a higher yield grade, that means I have a fatter animal. But if you hold fat and ribeye area constant, but you add 68 pounds to the carcass, you're gonna actually increase the ribeye, or the, the yield grade. So it may look like it's a fatter animal, it may just be a heavier animal. And so, we, we look at it th this way. So those are all the, the way that you can change the ribeye. So if you increase back fat, decrease, um, or increase, I guess. If you increase ribeye area, you'll drop the, the yield grade at the end. So I'll show you that so that I can show you this. So during that same cutout that we did, we were able to go back and say, okay, how did a Snake River Farms yield grade two perform. How do the yield grade three perform? How do four and so on versus the con conventionals? And what we're able to see is, yeah, there's more fat, but it's not. It's 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 hard for us to predict. There's more pounds, but we think that's a product of this hot carcass weight. So we actually think that this hot carcass weight might be a better variable than going through all the other exercise of trying to say, what about the ribeye? What about the back fat? And we we also know that. When we look at here, we get a lot of the percentages stay very similar. When you look at this in the conventionals, we see a bigger gap. And so we think that it's the work uh, for yield grade has some merit in conventionals. It's a lot harder to justify that same merit 
in the Snake River Farms. There are some things we watch for ribeye area. We don't want weird shaped ribeyes, so we watch for that and ensure that that's not going to show show up ever. We generally don't have a problem with that because not a lot of breeds do have that kind of problem. There's some that do, but um, I show you this actually as a segue for for Blake. So kind of remember this because he's gonna he's gonna talk a little bit about this. And finally. I don't know if I'm blowing through my time. Am I going really fast? Okay, okay. All right, finally, this is the last thing, and this is probably the thing that Blake's going to talk about. One of the things that we noticed, uh, at least recently and, and within the last few years, is, and you guys all know this, Wagyu aren't the same as, as other beef breeds. And um, a lot of times we have the processor, want to, want to fit them into the processor's way of processing rather than understanding. I think Arlie touched on this point about some of the novel cuts and, and things that you, they like to get pulled out that sometimes the processor, it's, it's hard to do. And so some of them you guys might be familiar with. Have you guys familiar with the, uh, the flat iron steak? Okay, so that, the flat iron, there's one called the Terry's shoulder tender. People call it shoulder tender sometimes. Um, these all came out of a, a 2000-ish, 2001, something like that study done at, uh, in combination with uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln and University of Florida. And there might be some other universities there. Uh, and, and what they did is they went and did, they called this the muff, beef muscle profiling study. You guys might be familiar with this. But the data that came out of that showed us, hey, we've, we've historically just said, here's a seven bone pot roast. Here is a chuck roast, or here's a round roast. Here's a eye of round, and, and kind of left at that. And then we stake everything in the middle. And what we found is that there's some muscles we're not utilizing. And so from that, the flat iron showed up. And it took a while, but it, you see it now in grocery stores. You, you hear about it maybe more than you used to. Some of the others that showed up out of there would have been that Terry's Major. Uh, it would be down here. So anything in white uh, here, this is a, essentially an, an acceptable tenderness. And so it's saying, hey, these are tender enough that people will eat as a steak um, is the idea. And so uh, we've, we've got some others. That, that show up in there. And then on the chuck side, uh, and I think Blake's going to show you some of these tonight, um, there was really three that showed up, but we've not done anything with. And the reason we've not really done anything with them is they're not very big and they're hard to get to in commodity cattle. What happens in Wagyu is when you go from an 850 or 900 pound carcass to a 1,000 pound carcass and they're shaped a little bit different, they end up being a little bit bigger and they matter a little bit more and they taste a little bit better. And so where or something like this pectineus or this uh, rectus femoris, where they might be borderline in a commodity animal, we're finding that those might be something we can use in a Wagyu animal. So I'm gonna leave, leave it with that because I think Blake's gonna take this and, and run with the rest of this, is that right? Any questions before I step down? Go ahead. Yeah, there would be, well, some of them would be, these, these right here would be very similar in carcass traits. So we kept them within similar marbling and, and things. So the age might be slightly different, but it's not significantly different. If that, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I don't, I don't know the actual answer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for what I say, for how many. Um, I, I'm betting there's 1,100 plus. I'm going to just throw it at that, leave it at that. So it's, it's a management in and of itself to manage that, that many bulls. So. Um, we, we try to hit somewhere in that 55,000 range. So it's, it's a lot. We need some Neogen guys here. That's who we work with. So, uh, yeah, so we would essentially what we do is it was we would take the mean. Uh, so if you understand EPDs, you take the mean. It's the deviation from the mean. So we'd essentially. Yeah, it kind of is. Um, we, we take all those animals and then we pull out some of the variables that we know would cause it, that we can, ha that we can control, right? And then we have to go back. So it's, some of it would go back as like we understand days on feet of that animal. If we understand some some driver seasonality or whatever, we can pull those out and try to dig down to that. So it's sure, yeah. 
as properties. Yep. Someone else had a hand up. Yeah, so we work we work with Neogen very very closely with that and we they have a group that what do you guys what's the name of that? Genomic Predictions Group. Genomic Predictions Group. 